start soon. What? The fact that he was here at 22, 22 C3, at least uh, I already told you. But the year between 35 C3 and 36, sorry, 34 C3 and 35 C3, also known as 2018, had a lot to talk about. And our next speaker will give us an overview about the things that at the German and the European level were taking place and what will happen in 2019. Please welcome with me the head editor of Netzpolitik.org, Markus Beckedahl. Yeah, <clears throat> good morning. I hope my voice will hold. Uh, the new edition of the best and the worst in net politics in Germany and the EU from yesterday and today. And my promise, I only have 14 minutes. Many topics that are relevant I had to leave out, but many <laughs> enough of them have been left as well. What's new from next year is that we have a government. Last year we had the failed coalition talks. Now we have a grand coalition, the Conservatives and Social Democrats, so that is Merkel 4.0. What's new, or what is old rather, that is that they still haven't, don't have a digital minister. And uh, as we know, the best digital minister doesn't help at all if we have idiots sitting in there, as we know from the EU. The good news is that after 13 years, Angela Merkel as a chancellor, digitalization in net politics has suddenly become a topic, has suddenly been on the agenda. There is a lot of work and there are expert circles. We kind of lose sight at netspolitik.org. I will just read out a few that have been founded. There's the Digital Cabinet, Digital Council, Digital Commission, the Think Tank Digitally Work Society, Digital Work Society Learning Systems Platform, uh, legal, legal things and uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, future of education. Those are just a few. And that's not bad, but... The problem is that there is a lack of coordination in the government. Now, the person responsible for coordination is Dorothy Bear from Bavaria. She is responsible for digitalization in the government and uh, for net politics in the government and communication to the outside. She thinks that data protection is, dis is a disturbance. Sometimes she regards bus timetables as a problem that have nothing to do with personal data. And there's this nice quote from her, what she wants, what she wishes for, I quote, nerds from outside have to give us their expertise and their creative powers for a time for the common good. So, dear government, it could be so simple. Why not just add a few civil society representative next to the industry lobbyists, why do all the parties in parliament invite nerds as experts, but the conservatives, CDUs, you never do? It could be so easy, and then the nerds will come because the offer has been standing for several years, we just have to accept it. The digital agenda is now called the implementation strategy, but what's lacking, unfortunately, is the strategy, which is not new, but the government, one or two years, uh, months ago, presented their implementation strategy and I took several approaches to comment this on netspolitik.org and I didn't know where to start. It's such a weird collection and uh, such a mishmash. All ministries send us whatever they do concerning digitalization and then uh, that will just be lumped together. That's what happened. And uh, at least you see that something is happening, but not with a lot of strategy. Let's come to the weather. Now, the bad news first, there's a storm coming, or for the target group that knows storms from the internet, this image. A running gag for many years that I've been doing Netz politic, Netz politics is the EU copyright reform. Meanwhile, it's the second reform that I have been following, and the EU copyright reform is on its last stretch. Uh, the one uh, Divisive issue are the upload filters in uh, Article 13 and the ancillary copyright in Article 11. Now, with the an ancillary copyright, I cannot really explain what the logic is. I haven't quite understood it. The question that I ask, that we ask ourselves is at netspolitik.org, can we still link to other articles with a headline uh, without having to pay a fee? Not even the politicians can tell us that. Great work was done by Julia Reda and her team 
Without her, it would all have been so much worse. A huge thanks to her. But mainly upload filters are a problem. They are a bigger threat to freedom of expression than the network enforcement law that was passed in Germany last year. Um, to define what is shown to us and what can be published is a problem. And the interesting question is where are the democratic controls when it comes to what the filters let through and what they do not let through. And about that, there'll be more later. There'll be more later. Now, the ancillary copyright, the German version of it, was the top expert into the EU. Uh, we commented, we actually said one and a half years ago on netpolitik.org that this would not be compliant with European law. So our readers will know. Uh, we did go to court about this as well because we wanted to know in the decisive session of the cabinet five years ago who was there, who took part and what was discussed because back then the Chancery Minister Eckhart von Kleden was responsible to, and, and his brother was a lobbyist of huge German publisher Springer, so we saw a conflict of interest there. So we went through until the, high, the Federal Administrative Court and we only got a partial judgment in our favor. So we will get the list of participants. The government never wanted to hand out that list of the people that had been there at that cabinet session because with the reasoning that the um, behavior of individual ministers could have been gleaned from that. So we thought that through. What we didn't get is that uh, that the protocols that are protected for 30 years will be handed out. They, have, they stay in secret. What is also new, Girls' Day in the Interior Ministry, uh, this is the famous picture of Horst Seehofer as he started his office. And that's not the only problem. The Grand Coalition has given us more surveillance author authorizations than any other previous governments. And uh, they now go into the extension round, basically. So um, we had obligatory upload filters as part of a censorship inf infrastructure, and they are in place already. There are, at the EU level, we've just had the debate uh, as a consequence of the EU Internet Forum. I think I talked about that two or three years ago, uh, three years in Hamburg. Um, that was a meeting between people from the large platforms and EU security officials and politicians and privatized law enforcement was the idea and uh, they wanted to insert upload filters, introduce upload filters, and they did that, and the m most platforms have installed upload filters of some kind, and now soon there will be the regulation uh, to prevent terrorist content online, and in our opinion, that is the same thing that we, uh, back then we prevented using the censorcular meme with Ursula von der Leyen, the then minister, and uh, our demand is that no, the law expects providers to remove content within one hour, and that will only be done through upload filters. That, that's the only possible way. And uh, whether that will help, um, and there will be instruments for automatic recognition. So, where then is the outcry if the very same thing happens that there w that was in the German censorcular debate, and no one's interested? That's a huge problem. Horst Seehofer, the interior minister, brought this on the way, but he won't be talking about this anymore. There was a conference of EU interior ministers where the EU Council uh, resolved to pass uh, that idea, and uh, the Austrian interior minister, in place of Horst Seehofer, said that that, that uh, the internet was a fire starter, a negative uh, uh, enhancer, there should not be a new Islamic state on the internet and gaps should be closed that had been closed in the real world. That were Those were his words. So what is terrorist propaganda? It's an interesting question, not really clear, clarified. But there was a case when at least part of the political spectrum, spectrum was of the opinion that that was terror-related and that was debate about the Hambach forest, which is a forest that is being... Um, raised for lignite mining 
and uh, there, that included climate protests, and there was di there were discussions from ministers saying that these will be close to terrorist content, so these might be filtered out automatically. And how this works in practice, we have researched. There is a hash database that is live, and uh, there are 50,000 hashes in there. Hashes are digital fingerprints of content that has been marked as terrorist, and these ha are administrated by Europol and added to this database. And we wondered what the democratic controls were, and we asked the EU Commission for that, that brought this all along the way, and those people said, oh, I don't know. And then we asked Europol, and uh, those, those people that actually insert all that data, and they said, oh, no, we don't know. And uh, therefore, we have a database that feeds those upload filters, supports them, and we have no democratic control because no one's interested in what, in what happens. Once something is in, it could stay in there forever, and we can't even talk about it because when uploading this, this automatically will be deleted, and we don't even know that something exists that we, can, that we should talk about. To the next item on the EU level, there's a lot happening there because the EU legislation, legislative period is ending in, in May, elections are coming, so many projects are on their final stretch, and... Uh, then from March, April on, they'll be campaigning, and uh, there is a, um, a project for e-evidence at the EU level. I think we had a talk about this yesterday, and the idea behind that is to equivalent to the American Cloud Act to make internet operators uh, within six hours hand out the users' data to to authorities. Otherwise, fines up to, for up to two percent of their global uh, income could be occur could occur. So if that goes through, there could a, an EU security authority could call a German internet provider and tell them, "Give us the data of this Hungarian opposition people that you host, and you have six hours to respond." How high is the likelihood that the provider will then take legal redress and face the risk of a, a fine? Uh, up to 2% of the global turnover. And um, this project that we this weakens the options of authorities to defend against violations of basic rights done by EU authorities, and this is something for legal nerds to consider, and it wrongly assumes that metadata are less sensitive than content data, uh, the usual problem, and it, the option gets into play that no judge uh, needs to approve, and uh, the question is, what are the rights of the affected people? And uh, as I've said, providers, hosting providers, are actually left without protection to the authorities. I. Searched, I, I found this picture from 2017 in Karlsruhe when the Constitution Court started talking about state Trojans and the state Trojan these they now is called source of surveillance, surveillance at the source and is now going to be forced through through laws at the federal state level in all these 16 states. What we, what we understand to be a state Trojan, which is a highly complex system of black markets where security holes are sold from dubious sources. The state Trojan software then uses these security holes, is armed with them. Now this, to many politicians, seems, well, state Trojan is such a, like a telephone that you buy at, at, the, at the retailer and, and you put that onto the computer. Uh, so we have to explain more what this is about because still, in the name of security, there's a massive IT insecurity that is being created if the state church is pursued, and that is the wrong way. And on top of that, this uh, state Trojans is another example of uh, how surveillance uh, authorization is uh, first put into place and then extended. We have researched, uh, researched 
um, how state trojans are used. Originally, uh, you know, the, the argumentation was for heavy, uh, heavy crime like m murder. And, well, we found out that most uh, targets are actually drug-related. And I think another drug policy would help more than a state trojan at this point. So you can find that in our merch shop soon. Um, the police laws have been uh, discussed by consensus courts. And they are in almost all uh, federal states by now. and um, So they are used uh, at um, impending uh, danger, so without an actual danger of uh, crime. So in Bavaria, you can be locked up forever soon. Um, in Bavaria, this has been explained by CSU logic. Um, so this supports uh, civil rights. And uh, this has been uh, the former and I think still current uh, interior minister, Hermann. Um, but that's bullshit, right? Uh, it's, it's just... Um, But the police laws uh, have a big, uh, big advantage because finally uh, tens of thousands of people go onto the streets uh, in support of civil rights. Not only in Bavaria, but also in Brandenburg, in North Rhine-Westphalia, in uh, Saxony. So here's a chance uh, for new, bigger uh, civil coalitions. Yeah, when so. And uh, on the topic of coalitions, uh, our old debate of uh, license plate registration. Uh, so the, uh, the government argues uh, with... Uh, Particle dust. Thanks. And, and this entire... Uh, so the government totally failed here. And the answer is uh, more surveillance. Uh, so the argument is that uh, uh, that license plate are so license plate scanner are the only practical uh, practical way of uh, enforcing the ban of older of older vehicles. Of course, there are milder ways of uh, enforcing this uh, this bans, and okay. if our uh, traffic minister doesn't know, then that's his problem, it's not ours. This is about environmental protections. Of something that doesn't uh, photograph the faces of the drivers. Here is another quote, quote from uh, Andreas Scheuer. So, the traffic minister, transport minister. This must be... Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, that, uh, what is called privacy. Uh, no one is talking about a surveillance state. Well, we do. That too was in 2018, a lot of protest against the trial of biometric video surveillance at the Südkreuz station in Berlin. Uh, many creative images, the scientific test of that surveillance technology in our view is a joke as the case computer cup among others found out, but we should discuss this at a more basic level, not just about error rates because those will improve in time, probably. And uh, baseless mass surveillance uh, of the open spaces by biometric ways uh, endangers our freedom. Two thousand eighteen is a year uh, why we are able to talk to computers, and they are talking back to us. And two thousand eighteen is uh, the year where people basically put uh, bugs in their own homes by their own free will. And the discussion around Alexa, Google, and what's their name, it's, it's just starting. And there are a lot of questions we need to discuss. For example, where are the, uh, where's the data stored? Is it on German servers? Is it on US servers? 
So with Prism, all the security agencies can access those. Who ha can access those in the first place? Uh, how secure is it? Where's the point where Alexa and Co. Uh, store everything forever because it's just more convenient for both the user and Amazon? Do we train with Alexa uh, a, German, uh, a global uh, voice biometric system so we can be recognized everywhere on the basis of our voice? Because everywhere there are Alexa uh, devices. And do these devices recognize me wherever I am? And when we are training such an artificial intelligence, so it knows us better and understands us better, and we are get used to this. And when do we reach the point where we can't leave the Alexa and the Google world anymore? Because we train them so much onto ourselves that uh, we would need to start over uh, when we leave them. And what could possibly go wrong? Uh, that's been asked by the CT, a German uh, computer magazine. Um, so someone did a, a, a GDPR request and got uh, got voice data from someone else. And so we need open and decentralized solutions which we can trust so we can actually use this uh, technology at home. That's what I wish. Otherwise, uh, we know from the big uh, data protection agencies, uh, we can learn a lot. For example, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, blocked his uh, web camera. Uh, Susan 17 wants its spot debate back. So we had this talk from Constanze and Ingo earlier uh, about disinformation. And this debate about disinformation is a debate we need to have, but uh, social bots is really the least of those problems. So, like with state Trojans, uh, we have the problem that politicians have this fuzzy idea of what a uh, bot is, and uh, they are talking past each other. For some, it's uh, Russian trolls. Um, for some, it's uh, artificial intelligence of a chatbot which you are talking to when you are, you know, talking to a customer support, which is an entirely different debate. But uh, you need to ask politicians, what are you talking about in first place? And what's clear is when you're talking to an artificial intelligence, then you need transparency. That's a consumer right, and we need to enforce those. But uh, we also need transparency in uh, studies that uh, spread panic because they're talking about social bots that no one can uh, actually understand. Because by now it's uh, common to to call any Twitter account uh, a social bot if more than 50 tweets uh, are made per day. Right, so we have a lot of problems in this. Uh, we have the problem in the society that we have a lot of people with too much time on their hands and too much anger, which easily reach this uh, 50 tweets per day, but that's not a reason to enforce uh, clear names. So we have Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Um, it's not the first data scandal from Facebook, and it won't be the last. So we are we have counted 21 uh, scandals, but just two or three days later, Facebook released new features, and all the journalists were busy with those new features. Cambridge Analytics is still uh, carrying on, um, and it shows that Cambridge Analytica is just the tip of the iceberg. As a, from at one of uh, maybe a thousand companies which uh, act in the same way and which are collecting data and in the same way uh, are using this data to manipulate people on Facebook or elsewhere. And congratulations for everyone uh, to who, who switched to Instagram or uh, WhatsApp in protest of Facebook's uh, practices. So that brought us a debate uh, how do we break up? How can we regulate platforms to enforce more consumer rights? Uh, breaking up Facebook is one necessary way, and Google too, because they have just simply become too powerful. And uh, as an example, Facebook and WhatsApp, when, when they bought WhatsApp, they promised the EU Commission that no data would be shared. Well, I would doubt that and simply take that back and... Uh, this is all about platform regulation, 
which rights do we enforce? How how do we strengthen the rights of users against platforms, against a take it or leave it policy? Um, how about media diversity? How do we create competition and how can we have privacy friendly alternatives and further them? That's uh, something where we have far too little from politics. 2018 also showed us that Facebook kills. In Myanmar, in, Ni in Nigeria, everywhere where uh, the company earns money but doesn't feel uh, responsible to support fact checkers with the right information. That's a problem too. And 2018 brought us a nice film uh, movie, The Cleaners, um, about content moderation policies in uh, great, uh, in big concerns. Um, so that's, so here you can see that uh, in 2018, that's a Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz. Network Enforcement Law. Oh. Uh, does less, uh, does less damage in practice than expected because uh, platforms are deleting everything anyway, which doesn't conform to their uh, community policies. And that's what we got from the uh, transparency reports. Okay, let's go to uh, slightly cloudy. Um, so, uh, from tomorrow onwards, everyone ha will have 50 megabits per second uh, broadband connections. At least that's what uh, Angela Merkel promised in 2017. Who doesn't have uh, 50 megabits? So look, even with among the nerds, there are plenty who doesn't, uh, who don't have that. So I know plenty of people in Berlin who can't go past 16 megabits, if they, even if they wanted to. So here we have Klesen Görne, um, one of the m most popular, uh, most well-known holes in the broadband. Yeah. Uh, mobile connection. So the telecom as a PR gig uh, erected a cell phone tower. And do you remember these, uh, these slogans? If, uh, if this doesn't work by tomorrow, well, with 5G, um, all problems will be solved. Well, we'll see if, uh, if, if 5G will actually come. And whether we all have gigabit connections. Also, so um, billions of support money were promised. Uh, after 4 billion were made available, uh, we can say that 2 million euros of those have been spent so far, some of them to consultants. You could say that broadband extension will actually support PowerPoint bingo more than anything else. And uh, there's a bit of progress regarding zero rating offers. At least there are no court judgments. Uh, the stream on offer from Deutsche Telekom is in violation of net neutrality. But the problem remains that zero rating as such is not seen as a violation of net neutrality and we need clarification there. It's not just telecommunications providers that have made their hands dirty in the net neutrality debate. It's also the organizations that take part in zero rating programs and get themselves a competitive advantage this way because they ha are getting premium access to customers. And that in particular, I'm referring to the public broadcasters that unfortunately have changed sides in this debate and take part, or at least are negotiating to take part. Shame on you, public broadcasters. We have an AI strategy. Uh, to involve civil society that uh, hasn't been uh, and tried in those meetings at the Chancellor's office. It was industry lobbyists, most of all. In the consultation, there wasn't even a button that someone could click on to be part of civil society if you were registering. Um, and I think research for better anonymization of uh, big data uh, and research on privacy by design and by default as a condition is sadly lacking. Another topic that 2018 was the year that many companies for the first time actually dealt with data protection. There was a lot of insecurity, lots of cease and desist letters were feared, not many came, but the detail of still hasn't been clarified, as is always the case with large legal complex compromises. But at least there are improvements for uh, users, there is the market location principle where you can go to the courts at home. There are large fines and, and large damage payments. 
and support from um, the supervising authorities. And we have a new public sport, which is GDPR inquiries. And the website is German Deine Daten, Dein Rechte, Your Data, Your Rights. Meanwhile, Max Schrems is trying to try this market location principle because he in Austria is now trying to take Facebook to court and Facebook think they still want to be taken to court in Ireland where the office is. Also, congratulations to Andrea Fosshoff, the Federal Privacy Commissioner, on the 7th of January, if her term will finally be over, will have a successor, Ulrich Kelber, who seems much more active, which isn't really hard. Um, so that might be an improvement. But one thing we have to call for much more consequently, there are many politicians calling for a doubling of the staff of the Interior Secret Service. Instead, we at least need a doubling of the staff of the Data Privacy Commissioner because these people defend our constitution much more. Now, to the EU privacy regulation, that's the small sister of the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU Parliament, with a one-vote majority. Uh, there was a vote for more users' rights. It's now in the EU Council and it's getting s stuck there. And our government was one of those that ha did actually take part in all the blocking. The EU privacy regulation could give us different things. No data process processing without consent, more protection from online tracking, privacy by default in browsers too, for example, limits to online tracking, uh, more transparency for state access. Of course, governments don't want this. We should discuss which values innovations should bring. What are these great data innovations if users don't know what happens in the background? And that's something, another reason why we need transparency in tracking. And also, the digital pact is coming, or it won't, or maybe. Good in principle, but again, 20 years late, as so often the problem with the digital pact might be that it's mainly seen as an investment support for Microsoft and Bethesman and the like, telecom, and we know that the best equipped schools will be of no use if teachers don't know what to do with these machines. And what is also missing is a consequent strategy to, for open source lesson materials. That's something we should look for. Yeah, running gag every year, Freifunk initiatives could be registered charities. There was another vote in the uh, in one chamber of parliament, it's now in the main chamber of parliament that has reformed. Grand Coalition, go ahead. That's not only something to do for voluntary engagement in the digital sphere, but also something against the digital gap in, uh, uh, on site. Now to the nice things. Uh, there are a lot of nice things, so we are uh, celebrating the open internet. One of the nicest science citizens projects was a, a bicycle meter. They had the sensors which were delivered to 100 uh, bikers in, in Berlin, which measured the distance to cars uh, over a long time span. Because technically cars uh, need to have 1.5 meters distance to bikes. Um, so when we are driving bikes on streets, we are uh, dependent on cars uh, holding themselves to that distance. And this project uh, showed nicely that even with a uh, science citizens project, uh, you can on the one hand uh, do nice and interesting things, but B, uh, you can also uh, start a public debate and this model should be probably extended to other things. Uh, one of the other nice projects in this year was uh, Open Laws, OpenGesetze.de. So, originally these, uh, these things were protected under, uh, under copyright, um, and you basically needed to pay to access those, but, according to the, uh, but thanks to the Open Knowledge Foundations, uh, they just scraped everything and put it on Open uh, Laws, uh, and uh, now it has been announced that this will be uh, put on the internet uh, from the start. So that's a great success. That's only a first step. Uh, also, legislation should be open and access accessible. Uh, we made progress on open access. 
with Project Deal, uh, German science publishers were uh, approached. So we are financing uh, science, and they are financing with our tax money a couple of private uh, publishers. Um, so they are pay. So they publish these results, and uh, well, you could do it differently, but we haven't so far. So now a lot of universities are, uh, are don't want to pay the, the publisher elsewhere because it doesn't want to take part in that deal. But here too is clear that um, open science needs to be open. We need real open access, and well, at least we are on the way there. So, whatever institute? Open knowledge? Oh, I don't know what institute it was. To research so on the social consequence of digitalization, and I think that's good, and without any irony, but again, it's at least 20 years late, but better late than never. Uh, then there was the, for the first time, there was the Bits and Trees conference, where the environment movement and the network movement for three days talked to each other, came together. That is another bit of progress. Uh, we had a sustainable IT conference some years back, and the problem then was that the environmental movement didn't really know that they were also affected by dis digitalization, but they have got the message by now, at least part of them. And this year we had 800 people in Berlin at our Das ist Netzpolitik, This is Netzpolitics conference. The first uh, took place five years ago, and back then everyone in the audience and on stage were about as old as me and male and this time for the first time I was about the oldest most of them were younger and it was much more female which is a nice development which shows that we do not have any problems with uh, new people so, and that's why we will go on and have another conference on the 13th of September and at the same time or just after we'll celebrate our 15th anniversary of netspolitik.org and another last thing Hans-Georg Maaßen the head of the Interior Secret Service who had been heavily implicated with right-wing politics has finally gone and we are still there and we've grown a lot and if you want to support us because that's what we live from live by we depend on people giving us voluntary donation, donations so that we can have an open offer. There's a silent SMS option for donating. Uh, you seem to have to send a message with the text Stille SMS to 81190, but then, of course, you can also uh, make regular donations through your bank account. Anyway, never give up. Never give up. 2019 will be a tough year. At the beginning of the year, with e-evidence, the terror regulation and the EU copyright reform, we have three big things at the EU level that will be bad. And the German government is getting heated up to get more surveillance laws on the way. So controlling power in the network is getting worse on each front. So fight for your digital rights, enjoy the conference, get informed, get active and get home well. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, also, I hope you've enjoyed the translation. You've been listening to Sebelis. And Strange Cliff. And uh, Markus says we have stickers and bags. Okay, anyway, we like your feedback as translators. C3T is our hashtag. C3Lingo is our Twitter account. Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah, questions and answers. Please line up behind the microphones. Those leaving the room, please be quiet so that we can hear the questions. One question from the internet. On the internet, there's insecurity whether the fact checking and the filtering by Facebook you like or you do not like, and uh, how this connects to the, uh, the rejection of upload filters. Uh, not at all. So I don't connect that at all to the EU upload filters. I think it's important that it, and I think it's right that there is democratic fact-checking institutions, even in ad, in platforms like Facebook. I'm I don't think it's okay that Facebook thinks it's that uh, they are free and uh, get money for that. 
So, especially in countries like uh, Nigeria and Myanmar, uh, where they get a lot of money for that and don't take any responsibility for all the fake news they get there. And that spreads really quickly there and that leads to pogroms and uh, genocide. So, there needs to be more work done here. Please wait collecting your bags until the talk is over and the Q&A is over, please. If there are any more questions, please line up behind the microphones. Okay, you the All right. <laughs> there will only be a bag if you ask a question now. That's another way. Okay, if there are any, no more questions, then surely you will be available later for all these people. Thanks. Ah, there is. A question on microphone four. Okay, and a follow-up question to the previous one. How, where do you see the limit between Facebook's responsibility and their censorship? Because that is a difficult thing. If Facebook gets, uh, takes action, whether it's bad for something or not. I think the financial problem is that we are having two approaches. Uh, on the one way, either you are a provider or you are media, then you are uh, liable liable for what's happening. Um, and with Facebook and YouTube and etc., uh, with monopolistic platforms, which are exactly in the middle, which we need to regulate with uh, a third way, because of course they have a certain responsibility, but I don't want that uh, Mark Zuckerberg also needs to... Uh, Legally, is legally liable for my net politics uh, website, P Facebook page. Right. So we need new approaches to regulation to solve this problem. So the answer is much more complex. Thanks a lot. Please a huge applause to Markus Beckedahl.